muting everyone um, except for um, Dr. Levon. Um, we will have the ability to take questions. You can put them in the chat or afterwards we will um, be able to uh, take questions directly to uh, Dr. Levon. And we wanted to welcome you today to our West Coast section, AWMA, Addressing Climate Change, COP to COP Negotiations in Progress. And welcome everyone, encourage people to join AWMA. We do have our ACE conference next month in San Francisco, for those of you that aren't aware. Uh, and I would like now to turn it over to Sarah. Sarah Head will introduce Dr. Levon. Okay, hello everyone. Um, so I'm very pleased to have uh, Dr. Levon speak today. Um, I've known Miriam for um, quite a long time back from her ARCO days and um, she's been uh, very involved with climate change over the years, you know, well before it uh, became the hot topic as it is today. And um, I know that she's also um, attended quite a few of the international uh, uh, Congress of the Parties or the, the big uh, um, climate change meeting that's that's held um, every so often. And um, I think uh, with that, you know, I, I, I think that she's been a real champion of um, climate change issues. And with that, um, Miriam, why don't you go ahead and take it away? Okay, thank you, Sarah. And thanks everybody for joining us during your lunch break. We're going to talk about how are, is the global community addressing climate change and how I nicknamed it COP to COP negotiations and progress. Next slide, please. First, let me talk to you a, a second about the Levon Group. The Levon Group is an environmental consultancy and facilitation company that's providing worldwide services in areas like air quality management, clean energy, greenhouse gas emission methodology, and climate change. It was created about two, th two decades ago in February 2002 in the lead into the World Summit and Sustainable Development. Next slide, please. So let's talk for a minute on the UNFCC process. UNFCC or United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, where each year negotiators meet in locations around the globe to discuss and make decisions on how to best tackle climate change. And the Conference of the Party or COP is the decision-making body of the climate change process. And the parties are the governments that have formally joined the treaty and they decide how to implement the treaty and promote climate action. Next slide, please. The UNFCC is supported by two sets of mechanisms. One is a technology mechanism, and the other one is a financial mechanism to help fund implementation. Next slide, please. So I'm not going to go through the whole history of all the conferences of the parties since its start. But I wanted to say that the direction of the negotiations have changed tremendously since COP21, which it was in Paris and which resulted in the Paris Agreement, in which the, the whole thrust of the climate actions was changed from having the UN provide a, the guidance and the mandatory emission reductions to, to making the countries provide their own contributions or determining what they can uh, contribute and stand by their own goals. So in preparation for COP26 in Glasgow, the United Nations published a synthesis report of the nationally determined contribution which it received from countries uh, in the years that passed between now uh, between the Paris Agreement. And the synthesis report indicated that the current NDCs would lead to a two and a half degree centigrade increase in global warming by 2050. And therefore it follows that nations must urgently redouble 
their efforts to prevent global climate change and to prevent temperature increase beyond the Paris Agreement goal of well below two degrees centigrade and some even aspire to one and a half degrees centigrade. Next slide, please. So what were the goals of COP26, the main goals that were set by the UK presidency of the meeting? And I have to mention that COP26 was convened in November of 2021, and this was in a turbulent time, just following the two years of the COVID uh, pandemic, where a lot of global meetings were canceled or were uh, were convened remotely. And this was the first time in two years that the negotiators met in person. And what was the goals that were set by the UK government uh, for this meeting? First of all, was to attain a very ambitious global emissions reduction goal to attain global net zero emissions by mid-century to limit global warming to one and a half degrees centigrade and then to enhance the climate mitigation adaptation efforts to address climate change. And the third, least, last but not least, is to ensure availability of adequate financing to enable climate mitigation adaptation actions. Next slide, please. So what happened in COP26? What were the key agreements? First and foremost, I should mention the phasing down of coal. One of the agreements was the, 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 glo the global community needs to phase down coal use and also to gradually reduce inefficient fossil fuel subsidies. I wanted to point out here that the terminology phasing down rather than eliminating and gradually reducing inefficient fossil fuel subsidies were added at the last minute of the declaration under pressure from India and China, because otherwise they would not have agreed to the final declaration. And the fact is that the countries will decide for themselves which subsidies are efficient and which are not. And it stands to reason that countries will most likely decide according to economic rather than environmental considerations. So that's something that might hamper progress uh, as we move forward. But also another of the agreements in the COP26 was to increase the target or the ambition for reducing the country's greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 and presenting new targets at COP27 at the end of 2022 in Egypt. Next slide. So what, what else was discussed in COP26 or agreed upon in COP26? The agreement was that countries need to meet a global target for adaptation planning in two years with obligations to enhance preparation for climate change. They, were, they agreed to pledge double funding for climate change preparedness by 2025 with a requirement to submit countries' policies on climate adaptation by COP27. And last but not least is agreeing on the final details for the implementation of the Paris Agreement, including new market-based mechanisms. I have to add here that the pledging of the double funding for climate change might be a little stretched right now with the war in Ukraine and all the amount of support that countries are providing to the Ukrainian government to fight Russia, they might be stretched thin to also provide support to climate change uh, mitigation. As far as the uh, final implementation of the Paris Agreement, that this is good news because the Paris Agreement is based on a con concept of transparency, namely that countries will report, will monitor and report in order for a global verification of how they meet the goals that they set to themselves. So they cannot just pledge and emission reductions, they have to actually demonstrate that they have attained it. So next slide, please. So now that we heard about the negotiations, what were the categories of climate actions? As you probably know, I'm not 
this is not new to people that are in the field is mitigation, adaptation, and resilience. Those are the three key tenets of climate action. Next slide, please. So mitigation of greenhouse gas emissions. Mitigation strategies are well known in California especially, but they need to spread to many other parts of the world. And they include retrofitting buildings to make them more energy efficient, adopting renewable energy sources like solar, wind, and small hydro, advancing innovation and technology transfer for sustainable energy breakthrough, helping cities develop more sustainable transport systems and promoting more sustainable use of land and forests. Next slide. So what do we need to do for enhanced adaptation planning? Parties to the UNFCC and the Paris Agreement recognize that adaptation is a global challenge that is faced by all and it is a key component of the long-term global response to climate change. You cannot have just just rely on mitigation, you have to have adaptation measures in order to protect people, livelihoods, and ecosystems. And parties acknowledge that adaptation action should follow country-driven and participatory and transparent approach, where adaptation planning should be based on the best available science, and adaptation should be integrated into environmental policies and actions. Next slide, please. This is what the UN envisions as the adaptation cycle. It has four pillars. The one is where you assess impact, assess impacts of climate change, look at the vulnerability and risk. Then you develop plans for adaptation, following by implement adaptation measure, and then monitor and evaluate the adaptation and go back again to assessing remaining impacts, vulnerability and risk. And this, and this way, the cycle of improvement goes on and on, and every cycle you improve some of the measures that uh, you employ. Next slide, please. Besides the UNFCC process, which is a negotiation process, we have also a science assessment process, which is the IPCC process. IPCC is the International Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, is a global body of the United Nations. It is charged with analyzing the science related to climate change and provides guidance to world leaders as they develop and refine climate policies. The IPCC issues comprehensive assessment reports every six to seven years and in which they synthesize the latest research. They don't do any new research. They just synthesize all the publications and all the relevant publications that were issued since their last assessment. And they summarize uh, everything, including providing a summary for policymakers to draw their attention <laughs> to what actions need to be taken in order to reduce the impact of climate change. And hundreds of top scientists from 195 countries contribute to IPCC reports, and then they are reviewed by thousands of other experts. And as you all know, the IPCC received the Nobel Peace Prize uh, way back when in one of their first assessments. Next slide, please. So in February 2022, uh, IPCC Working Group 2, which looks at the impact issued this report. I have to say, let me backtrack here uh, a second. There are three working groups in the IPCC. Working group one it summarizes the science, the basic science of uh, climate change. Working group two looks at the impacts of climate change. And working group three looks at mitigation measures that are uh, advisable. So working group two, let's go back to working group two. They issued their report in February 22. And the average, they claim that the average temperature in the decade from 2011 to 2020 is higher by over a degree centigrade than the average temperature between 1850 and 1900. With the last five years are the hottest on record since 1850. 
the rate of sea level rise in the last decade is three times higher than the between the 70 years from 1901 to 1971. And human action is most likely contributing to the acceleration of iceberg melting since 1990. And there is a risk that extreme heat events, as we noticing the extreme droughts and extreme fires, will occur at a much higher frequency than in the past. Next slide, please. So working group three on mitigation, they just issued the report in April 2022, and they provide an updated global assessment of the climate change mitigation progress and explain development in emission reduction and mitigation effort. And they state that the transition to a low carbon economy depends on a wide range of closely intertwined drivers and constraints that advancement over the past decade have opened up new and large scale opportunities for deep decarbonization. Then they're saying that we have the technologies, just that we need to have the will and the funding in order to be able to implement this technology. Next slide. More from the IPCC Working Group 3 report. They state that the global net anthropogenic GAG emissions during the decade 2010 to 2019 were higher than any previous time in human history. and Globally, the gross domestic product per capita and population growth remained strongest drivers of CO2 emissions from fossil fuel combustion. Although this seems like it's gloom and doom, but a growing number of countries have achieved greenhouse gas emission reductions for over 10 years, which is uh, the good news. Next slide, please. So what are the key factors for successful climate action? This include technology research and development in order to bring to the fore new, method, new methodology. It requires governments to be leading by example. It requires the development of standard rules and regulations that can ensure equal implementation of measures across sectors, and then international collaboration to help advance the progress. Next slide, please. I'm going to talk about a little bit about some select examples of government actions in conjunction with COP26 in Glasgow. I'm not going to expand a lot on this because it's uh, because of time. So first of all, the cat. All the examples have to the examples have to do with federal uh, government actions. Canada's federal government. The top line is that the government of Canada operations will be net zero emissions by 2050. And the government will adopt low carbon mobility solutions and deploy supporting infrastructure in its facility to modernize its fleets. The government of Canada will aid its economic sectors in the transition to a net zero. The, the government of Canada is taking responsibility for its action in the federal government operations, but they will also aid the economic sectors in transition to a net zero circular economy through green procurement that includes life cycle assessment principles and the adoption of clean technologies and green products and services. Next slide. The, the European Union has actually enacted a law that has a legal objective for the EU to reach climate neutrality by 2050 with an ambitious 2030 climate target of at least 55% reduction of net emission of greenhouse gases as compared to 1990. The, the European Union is developing a process of setting 2040 climate targets and considering indicative greenhouse gas budgets for the period between 2030 and 2050, and it's going to be published by the European Commission uh, this year, and including a commitment to negative emissions after 2050. The EU, EU has pledged to engage with all sectors to prepare sector-specific roadmaps 
charting the path to climate neutrality in different areas of the economy. Next slide. The United Kingdom was the presiding body of the COP26 and they, ahead of COP26, they had the Climate Change Act in which requires, provides a legally binding carbon budget to, to act as a stepping stone towards the 2050 target and to act as a cap on the amount of greenhouse gas emitted in the UK over a five-year period. So they slotted five-year periods from 20 20 to 2050 to reach their uh, target. But in concert with COP26 actions, the UK government has announced new climate change commitments to cut carbon emissions by 78% by 2035. They wanted to lead by example. Heating the targets would require more electric cars, low carbon heating, renewable electricity. And for the first time, the UK expects to include, to, to cover, I'm sorry, to cover international aviation and shipping in the emission restrictions. Next slide, please. So what is the US government doing? The US, gover the US government has no Climate Action Act yet, but there are a couple of executive uh, actions that are mandating what the government ministries or government departments are supposed to do. The last, the most recent executive action was signed in December 2021 following COP26 and it has very detailed ambitious goals for the federal government, for federal government operations, namely 100% carbon pollution free electricity by 2030, 100% zero emission vehicles acquisition by 2035, net zero from federal procurement <laughs> no later than 2050, net zero emission building port portfolio for the federal government by 2045, and net zero emissions from overall federal operations by 2050, including a 65 emissions reduction by 2030. And the executive action states that the anticipated actions will make federal agencies more adaptive and resilient to the impact of climate change and increase the sustainability of federal supply chain, achieving net zero emissions from federal procurement by 2050. So that seems to be the target of all the countries is looking forward to 2050 and either net zero or on the road to net zero. <clears throat> I have to add here that China has declared that they will be net zero by 2060. They are not joining the 2050 club. So in undertaking all these actions, we have to look at the role of international cooperation because in the context of the Paris Agreement, there is a need for continued international cooperations and it's critical that it will stimulate countries to enhance levels of mitigation ambition since each country is setting up its own level of mitigation ambition there needs to be kind of a peer pressure to help countries lead to enhanced uh, levels of mitigation and deploy various means of support to increase the likelihood that that they achieve their objective namely that developing countries provide support and low carbon finance, technology support, capacity building and enhance South-South cooperation. Next slide, please. Notable partnership and pledges that were declared in uh, COP26 is first of all, is the Glasgow Leaders Declaration on Forest and Land Use. It was signed by 120 countries to halt and reverse forest loss and land degradation by 2030 and it is backed by public funds for forest conservation and a global roadmap to make 75% of forest commodity supply chain sustainable. One that is close to my heart because it's an area that I'm working on is the Global Methane Pledge. It was signed by over 100 countries 
and it's designed to commit to collectively reduce global methane emissions by 30% by 2030 from a 2020 baseline from all sectors. Next slide, please. So what do we expect in 2022? The work program has the following main priorities for climate actions in 2022. First is to strengthen and mainstream resilience, to finance climate action, to accelerate immediate action, build credibility and trust in non-party stakeholders action. And I have to say the non-party is non-national government. So it's regional, local and city organizations, including civic societies that are undertaking joint actions and tracking progress and enhancing the participation of non-state actors. <clears throat> the picture in 2022 is a little bit complicated because of the war in Ukraine and a lot of the funding that maybe would have been designated to go to the Green Carbon Fund uh, would not be available because so much money is being invested in aid to Ukraine and aid to the refugees from Ukraine because of the war against the Russian war uh, in Ukraine. So the upcoming COP27, the, uh, the Climate Change Conference will convene in November 2022 in Egypt, in Sharm el Sheikh, a beautiful resort area on the Red Sea. It will bring together participants to agree on coordinated action to continue addressing climate change and look at what's possible to do with the constraints of the new geopolitical uh, considerations and especially the instability in the energy markets, which is causing some shifts back to coal, you know, from all the countries that were going back to gas instead of coal are now reconsidering whether to go back to coal because of the lack of security in the gas supply. Before COP, sorry, don't go back. Before COP27, there is a, also an annual mid-year UN climate change meeting in Bonn, Germany. It's the intercessional. It's, it's going to take place in June 2022 and it includes meetings of the subsidiary body for implementation, which looking at policy measures and subsidiary body for scientific and technological advice, which looking for mitigation adaptation measure. This negotiation sessions are an important milestone for parties to advance discussions in preparation for COP27. Next slide. So in summary, more ambitious climate actions are expected from all nations prior to the next conference of the parties, which is COP27 in November 22. There is a specific desire to, to undertake what they call stock taking, namely under, analyze where do we stand right now and what else needs to be done in order to ensure emission reductions by 2030 and then net zero by 2050. Developed countries are expected to step up their internal action plans as well as their contributions to global finance, financial commitments to accelerate goal accomplishments. But as I said, this might get complicated with the new geopolitical situation in the energy markets and the vast amounts of support that are poured into the war in Ukraine. But multilateral collaborations are essential to showcase best practices for attaining global goals and mitigation, adaptation, and enhancing climate resilience. Thank you. Miriam, this is Richard. Thank you for your presentation. I sent you a question in chat. Uh, basically, could you clarify what you meant by net zero emissions? Well, 
It's an excellent question because I think the world is struggling with this, how to define the methodology of what is net zero. There are some that define net zero as actually zero direct emissions. There are some that define net zero as being emissions mitigated or offset by projects that are recognized by countries or by the international uh, community. So whether, for example, the WRI science-based target initiative has one reading of this and they will not accept offset projects to, uh, to count towards net zero, while other countries like uh, Brazil, for example, want all their projects in uh, CDM projects that that were done in the past uh, years to count towards uh, an offset for their country's emissions. So, and, and the climate action registry, the, the, the climate registry is working on a protocol and there are some other protocols being developed uh, globally uh, to address this methodology. Thank you, Miriam. Um, I'll also add, you know, California, the, the, the net zero is, is kind of the new buzzword uh, that I see it a lot in what I'm doing. And we have um, legislation in California, such as Senate Bill 100, which is looking to make all the power sector net zero. Um, what I think Bashkar is in it by 2030 or 2045, I forget what year, but Anyway, there are a lot of efforts right now to um, to decarbonize the uh, um, at least the power sector as well as some of the other sectors. So it's a it's a big push um, in California as well as the world. Um, does anyone else have a question for Miriam? I guess I will ask a question. Um, so uh, Miriam, you mentioned that methane specifically is very uh, dear to your heart, can you expand on it a little bit? Excuse me, I'm sorry, I didn't hear, I didn't get you. Oh, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, but it was not okay. clear. Okay, so what I meant was that in the presentation you mentioned that specifically methane emissions and the reduction in methane emissions is uh, very special to you. Can you expand on it and why do you think methane reduction um, is very important? Well, there's been a recognition in the last, uh, especially couple of years, that methane is a big contributor to greenhouse gases. Since the beginning of the negotiations, the emphasis was on CO2. And CO2 is the largest emitter, that's true. But CO2 is also a very long-term resident in, in the atmosphere. Methane is a short-term resident in the atmosphere, only 12 years lifetime, atmospheric lifetime, but has a, a much higher global warming potential that contributes to the warming of the atmosphere and mitigating methane might be a quicker way of lowering the impact on temperature and, and mitigating climate change. So there are many, many initiatives, global methane initiative, oil and gas methane initiatives, oil and gas methane partnership number two that sprouted over the last couple of years and led to a recognition, a global recognition that there's a need for a concentrated effort on methods for methane reduction from three key sectors. One is agricultural sector, the other one is the waste sector, and the third one is the oil and gas sector. And there are, uh, there's a lot of activities in all three sectors and global activities, and that culminated in the methane pledge that was issued in uh, Glasgow. Thank you. Um, we do have one question in the chat. It's from Harish Ra, it's saying, Miriam, thanks for the presentation. Is there any progress being made in agricultural practices for carbon sequestration 
in soil? Well, I, I think there is a lot, there is a recognition, especially I, I'm hearing this a lot in England about no-till agriculture because they see that the, the topsoil has eroded tremendously over the years because of the heavy tilling has created loose soil that washes away with uh, the increasing intensity and ferocity of the storms. So there is a recognition that no tilling agriculture uh, is advisable. But there is also a lot of resistance from applying uh, control measures or anything that will increase the cost of food or the cost of agricultural uh, production. So this is an area that needs a lot of work yet. Anybody else has questions? You just have to unmute yourself to ask the question, or you can type it in the chat box. I guess I'll ask another question. Um, so, is there any database that countries can access uh, to see how, how or what actions other countries are taking? Um, I know that IPCC report summarizes the research that is being done, but what resources are available to countries to see what other well-performing countries are doing? Well, the NDC, the, the nationally determined contribution, is a report that is submitted by countries, by individual countries, to the United Nations, and the United Nations files an archive of all the report, the national reports, and one can go and download every country's report and see what the country is proposing as their target and as their action to mitigate climate change. And this is what I said at the beginning of the presentation, the assessment report that uh, the UN has done before COP26 was based on the NDCs that were available to it as of August of uh, 2021. So it's very important to look at what other countries or similar countries uh, are doing in order to understand what is doable, what's what's feasible, and to really see what the thinking is about how to implement uh, climate mitigation adaptation. Thank you. But as, as I said before, everything is a toss-up this year. It's, it's not clear how what progress will be made with all the heavy investments in the war in Ukraine, although there are some that are trying to, to integrate the, the uh, support that is given to Ukraine, for example, with making sure that it's rebuilt in a more sustainable uh, manner, but it's still uh, a lot is up in the air and the uh, International Gas Union just issued a report this week on the state of the gas industry worldwide, and they see a trend of increased emissions because of several countries are switching back from gas to coal for power generation because they the security of their energy system with the instability in the gas market. And the, and the U.S. is doing a lot to try to supply the gas internationally, also pr providing more LNG, but it takes time to develop the new LNG projects and really bring the gas to market. So in the immediate future, there might be a, an increase in coal consumption to ensure the availability of power. Any other questions? OK, 
Simon, you want to close? Sure. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Lavon, for uh, the presentation. Uh, a lot of information, uh, helpful information. Thank you very much. Um, and also, thank you very much, everyone else, for taking the time to attend today's webinar. Uh, we are going to have uh, an, a few more webinars that are posted on our website. Um, and we will be sending announcements. Uh, and also, you can sign up on our website uh, to get uh, the future announcements as well. And with that, uh, uh, I, I guess we can uh, all go back to uh, the rest of the, the day. Uh, Bhaskar, if I missed anything. Yeah, no, we'll be putting up the presentation on our website at the same page that this announcement is there. So you can access it, you know, we'll put it up by tonight. So yes, and also the report. Thank you everybody for inviting me to, to contribute and thank you to Sarah for pushing me uh, and <laughs> Brian Richards for pushing me to do that. And uh, if there are any other questions that people want to uh, contact me. My email is on the top of the presentation and you can contact me and I would be happy to uh, respond. Thank you, Miriam. Okay, Thank bye. You, Miriam. Thank have you. a wonderful Memorial Day to everyone. Uh, yeah, happy, happy holidays. Bye. Bye-bye.